But let's go to the Bible this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And we're actually going to go a little bit into chapter 11 this morning. We'll begin reading in verse number 23, reading down through verse 1 of chapter 11. Now, we have been studying the 1 Corinthians for uh, this entire year. We started at the beginning of this year. But over the last several weeks, we've been looking at this, these challenges that Christians face. But over the last several weeks, specifically the challenge of Christian liberty. Now, I'm reminded of a story that I read of Charlie Brown, good old Charlie Brown. And he was laying in his bed one night contemplating life. And he said, he was telling someone the story, he said, Sometimes I lie awake at night and I ask, where have I gone wrong? He said, but then a voice says to me, this is going to take more than one night. (laughs) Well, this section on Christian liberty has taken more than one sermon, but Lord willing, this will be our last sermon on this specific challenge. As we've gone through challenges Christians face, we've looked at Christian liberty. We've looked at challenges to marriages and challenges of singleness and challenges of widowhood. We've looked at challenges of division and challenges of, uh, of people thinking they are superior and those sort of things and We're going to close out this morning the challenge of Christian liberty. Beginning in verse 23, the Bible says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye ye are disposed to go, ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I live by grace, be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether therefore you eat, or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give non offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning asking that you would speak to us through your word. I pray to your Lord that you'll use me this morning as a mouthpiece. That Lord, I should say everything that you would have said this morning And not leave anything out. But at the same time that I would refrain from speaking anything that you would have not to be said this morning. I pray that our hearts will be open. I pray that our minds will be clear. That we may listen to you through your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2004, there was a tsunami. Many of you are old enough to remember the tsunami that hit a total of 227,000. 898 people died in that tsunami. But even in the midst of tragic stories, there are often stories of uh, of heroism. And there was a case of a little girl who had been highlighted on a magazine for being child of the year in 2005. Her name was Tilly Smith. She was 11 years old. She was a British schoolgirl and saved about 100 tourists. Because as she was looking out across the way, she saw the conditions that she had just learned about in class. Finally, a kid that paid attention in class noticed some conditions in in the area and warned them of the tsunami that was to come. And about a hundred people didn't perish because of the heroism of one. Her model is a model that Christians are called to each day, and that is to take the knowledge of the gospel that you know, implement it into our routine. This girl wasn't sitting there looking and thinking, you know what, 
I had science class a couple weeks ago, and we learned about the conditions of the tsunami. And so for the next hour, I'm going to be on guard. This girl was just living her life. And as she was living her life, she noticed what was going on around her. And as Christians, we are called in that same calling to take the knowledge of what we know and to be on guard at all times that we could spare lives, not for temporary moments but for all of eternity. The Apostle Paul has been helping the Christians in Corinth to understand how the gospel fits into their daily routines and their daily life. Too often we want to farm out the gospel and too often we want to to set aside only a certain time for the gospel. But Paul is writing to the Christians in Corinth and saying to them that it ought to be a daily part of your life. He was specifically concerned about how the Corinthians were relating to the Jews and the Gentiles, the lost about them in relation to their Christian liberty. You'll hear a lot today, even in 2020, of this thing called Christian liberty. And can I say this? I am thankful for the liberty that is in Christ Jesus. However, this liberty is to be used and not used in a certain way. So in our final lesson on this idea of Christian liberty this morning, we're going to look at some practical directions. I like practical directions. I, I'm, I like philosophy. I like to sit down and talk about philosophy. But more than that, I like a one, two, three, four, this is what you do. I am a give me the instructions, give me a list, let's follow the list. I actually am not one of those that... When all else fails, read the instructions. My take is read the instructions first and don't be a failure. But anyway, we, that's my fault. And I like practical advice. And I'm thankful that the Word of God gives to us practical advice. So let's look at it this morning. First of all, we notice in verse 23, 24, 32, and 33 that God wants us in using our Christian liberty to seek the good of others. Can I say one of the characteristics that is so common in today's Christianity and this use of Christian liberty, it's this, what do I want? What do I want to do? And many people misuse Christian liberty with the understanding that it's all about me. So Paul writes here in verse 23, he says this, All things are lawful unto me, but... Now, let me teach you something very quickly. Don't worry, I'm not going to take you back to English for too long. But there's something very interesting about that conjunction, but. It's called a negatory conjunction in the sense that what is to follow this conjunction is to downplay what was said before. You say, what do you mean? It's when somebody says, I love you, but what's about to follow is their excuse for why they're not showing love to you. That's what it is. And here Paul writes and says, all things are lawful for me. But, there's a caveat. We're about to tell you something that is going to explain why we shouldn't do all things. He says this, not all things are expedient. Now this word expedient means good for you. There are certain things that are lawful for you, but it doesn't mean it's the best practice. Now, let me give you an example. Now, I know when you hear this, you're going to go, you're talking about that? I am. I know. Country ham. I love country ham. I do. It's some good stuff. Now, in the Old Testament, the Jews couldn't eat country ham. And some of you are thinking right now, I'm glad I'm not a Jew, and I'm glad I didn't live in the Old Testament. But one of the things I realize, though it's lawful for me to eat, I personally understand I shouldn't eat it every morning. I just shouldn't. I'll be honest with you. I, I usually try to limit it to about once a year. You can almost, as you're eating it, you can almost feel the arteries clogging. Some people say it lubricates. I don't know. But I know this. Just because it's lawful doesn't mean you should. It's lawful for, you for, lawful for you just to eat ice cream. But I do not recommend an ice cream diet. See, there are certain things that are lawful for you, but that doesn't mean you ought to do it. It's lawful for me to run for office. 
But I'll be honest with you, I'd be out of the will of God, therefore it's not good for me to run for office. We could go on and on with examples, but Paul is writing here and says, listen, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Then he says this, all things are lawful, but all things edify not. Not everything I do is going to be for the good of others and build up others. In fact, if we're not careful in our exercising of Christian liberty, we will cause others to stumble. We must be careful with this. Let me give you just a quick practical example. I told you I like practical. Let me give you a quick practical example. I don't use words personally that also are curse words, but aren't curse words when used in context. Now, I'm not going to give you examples this morning because I don't do that. And I'm going to tell you why. There are certain words that used in context, they're not a curse word. Used out of context, they are a curse word. I don't even personally use them in context, not because of the people I'm talking to, but the people who may walk by and hear me. Now, you say you're going too far. When we understand here just a little bit later the reason why, I think you'll understand why. Now, I will say this, because there's one that comes to mind, and some of you might go, I wonder if he does that. When I read the Bible, I read it exactly like the Bible says. But the rest of the time when I'm talking about it, I use the word donkey. I'm going to tell you why. It's not because everyone who's focused in and paying attention won't get it. It's the one that's out there that only pays attention every now and then. You've been there before where you're off base and then you come back. And when you come back, you're like, what did he just say? I remember one time, I'll just give you an example of this because none of y'all would ever do that. But there was somebody at our school that uh, I was preaching a sermon and I got just a little bit into the introduction and I said, for the remainder of the sermon, I'm going to speak as if I were the leper. And so I was telling this story and I was talking about my daughter. This was before. So this is over eight years ago because it was before uh, I had any kids. And one of the students came up to me afterwards. He goes, I didn't know you had a daughter. I said, well, you obviously weren't listening the whole time. (laughs) And I don't want to call someone to stumble. And we'll look at the reason why here shortly. All things are lawful, but that doesn't mean we ought to put it into practice. Verse 24, let no man seek his own. It's not about you, but every man another's wealth. Can I tell you this? Selfishness is of the flesh. It is. We all struggle with it because we're all in the flesh. We all look out for ourselves first, but the Bible says here, listen, it's not about you. And one of the problems where people pervert Christian liberty is they make it all about what can I now do? What can I, here's the words, get by with? I'll put it another way. What do I think I can handle? Anytime I hear somebody say, I know this isn't best, but I can handle it, that's normally what's going to take them down. But they make it about themselves. So to make sure he's not misunderstood, he makes it very clear. He goes on in verse 32 and 33 and says, Give not offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. He says, listen, be careful. The Jews and Gentiles, they are are both lost groups of people. And he says, listen, you shouldn't be going out and offending and giving offense to the Jews. You say, yeah, but they're, they're, they're just sensitive. Well, how about you be sensitive? The Gentiles, they are just wicked. Well, how about you not join in with them? See, the problem is... Even in those statements concerning these groups of people, we're making it all about us. Can I tell you what? This may not be a popular statement, but it's a truthful statement. Sometimes we are so focused on nationalism that we forget Christianity. We do. We put our culture equal with Scripture if we're not careful. And when we see somebody of another culture, they're just doing it wrong. Let me give you an example. We'll see churches across America. And can I say this? Churches across America have different cultures. They do. And that's okay. That doesn't mean they're wicked and sinful. But churches have different cultures. There are some churches, I call them not in a slander way or, or a derogatory way. They're what I call high churches. 
Their music is what I call high church music. And I don't want to try to give you an example because I can't do it. I'm not a high church singer. I like to sing the way I preach. Just let her rip. <laughs> it's just, that's just the way it is. It's a different culture. Do you know you won't find a piano in a lot of churches across the world? You know what you'll find? A guitar. Different culture. It's fine. Singing the same songs, honoring the same God, but if we're not careful, I think, I think of in, in missions, for instance, we have several missionaries across the world. Some people go to foreign countries and try to make Americans out of them more than they do making Christians out of them. And Paul says, listen, it's not about my cultural rights. It's about Christianity and the cause of Christ. We have to be careful with this. We make it all about us. If somebody looks different than us, talks different than us, acts different than us, we'll begin to think that we're superior. And remember this, we're not superior to anybody. Because at the foot of the cross, it's level ground. Jesus had to die for you as much as he had to die for anybody else. And that's just the truth. Can I tell you this? Jesus died for you as much as he died for Adolf Hitler. The only difference is you accepted him and he, by obvious testimony, rejected him. That's the truth. Your sin put Jesus Christ on the cross as one of the most notorious men ever in history. When we understand that, we realize I'm no better than anybody else. The only thing that's good about me is the grace of God. We need to stop making Christianity about ourself. Notice verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Let me say something about this verse. If you're going to please all men in all things, that means you're going to displease yourself sometimes. Have you ever noticed how the lack of selfishness sometimes is very unpleasing? I'll, I'll use the illustration that I use too much, but as soon as I mention it, it'll come to your mind. Ice cream. You go to the ice cream container and there's only one left and two of you are going to go get it. It's so much more pleasing just to eat it yourself. So the lack of selfishness, letting the other one have it, is not as pleasing to you but Paul said, that's my goal. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, it's not about what I want, it's about what you need. How many times do we go into life, even if we're not careful, sometimes under the scope of ministry, and we make it about ourselves? And Paul says, listen, it's not about me. Christian liberty is about seeking the good of others, whether it's Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. So first of all, in this idea of Christian liberty, it's not about you. Therefore, you ought to seek the good of others. Secondly, I want you to notice this. He says to eat marketplace food. Look at verse 25 and 26. Whatever is sold in the shambles. Now, the shambles was a name for the meat market. So whatever is sold in the shambles, that eat. Asking no question for conscience. Sake. Verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, as we've talked about in the past, a portion of the meat that was taken for sacrifices was taken to the meat market. Typically, the priest would sell it to the meat market. And then the meat market would sell this meat to people, to, to people who are shopping in the meat market. So the Jewish rabbis placed a lot of restrictions on Jews who lived in these pagan cities like Corinth because they were very fearful that they were going to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. They had to make sure that they bought only, you've heard this term before, kosher meat. In fact, today there are, are Jews who still, they'll only eat kosher food. They're still practicing those rabbinical laws that were given many years ago. But that wasn't Paul's policy. And by the way, when I say Paul's policy, Paul, remember, is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this isn't Paul's opinion. This is God's opinion. Paul said that believers could eat whatever sold in the market without raising any questions. They didn't have to go into investigation mode. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit of 
an investigator. I like to research things and figure things out because I like truth and I want to know the truth and I want to know what's behind this and I want to know what's behind that. That's my mentality. But here Paul says, listen, you don't need to go into inspector mode. You're not going in and and, uh, asking all these, go buy the meat, eat the meat, that's fine. And he goes on to explain, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You know, a lot of people don't actually believe that. You say, really? No, they don't. A lot of people have this idea that God owns half and the devil owns half and they're in a custody dispute. That's how people live. Now, they won't say that, but there's a lot of things that we don't say that we believe. Can I give you an example myself? It took me a long time to believe what God said when he said it's God's job to build the church. You say, really? Oh, yeah. I used to put so much pressure on myself that I had to do a good enough job in order for it to take place. And I realized a while ago, I can't do a good enough job, but it's not my job. My job is to be faithful. My job is to be faithful. So then I finally believed, as a, instead of having an intellect, I had a heart knowledge. A lot of times, biblical truths, we have an intellect, but we haven't believed it in our heart yet. And then I made a promise to God. And I say a promise... I was honest in my promise. I said, Lord, I'll try my best not to try to do your job. And I'll try my best to make sure that you don't have to make up for mine. Meaning, I'll do my part, you do your part. God owns everything. He does. He owns everything. You've heard this before. He owns the cattle on the thousand hills. I heard one preacher, he, he was talking about, he had this old van and it was about to fall apart, but he didn't know how he was going to replace it. And he had insurance on it, but insurance doesn't fix all the things that's wrong with it. It just fixes if something terrible, catastrophic happens to it. And one day he's driving along and all of a sudden the airbag deployed and he didn't know what had happened. When he finally pulled himself out of the van, he looked, there was a cow that had been crossing the road And he hit that thing, and of course insurance covered the replacement of the vehicle. And he said, praise the Lord, he owns a cattle of a thousand hills, and he just gave me one. (laughs) But he does. He says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he says, go eat what's in the meat market. This morning I walked past the meat section in a store. And I was thinking about the message, and I thought about... How ridiculous it would be. And this is what Paul's talking about. For me to say, oh, yes, I need to speak with the uh, meat manager. He comes out. I want to know the lineage of this beef and exactly what took place. And it's, that's what he's saying. Don't do. Several years ago, my wife and I, we were on a date. And this was before we were married. And we were in Chicago. And we were on a date. And we went into this store called Crate and Barrel. And if you're not familiar with Crate and Barrel, it's like a household furnishings type thing. Silverware and all that kind of stuff. We're in this store. We've been in the store a couple times. It's a really neat store, but it's one of those stores you go and look and you don't buy. You're very careful you don't break anything. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. This salesman comes up to us. We're looking at this cutlery. We always call it silverware. Cutlery. And uh, most of the silverware I've seen is sold in like, you know, four-place settings, six-place settings. No, these were sold in the one-place settings. And when I say they're sold, I guess people buy them because they were expensive. I'm talking like over $100 for a fork. Let's see, I think it's two forks because fancy people eat with more than one fork. I think it was two forks, a knife, and a spoon, I think it was, for over $100. This gentleman comes up and goes, are you all interested in some fine cutlery. I'm like, oh, we're just looking. He's like, well, I noticed that you were looking at this one. And he starts literally giving us the lineage of the man who designed the cutlery and how he had a pedigree in his family of being cutlery designers. And I'm like, I didn't know they had those. But he's saying, listen, when you go into the meat market, you don't walk through the meat market and go, I don't eat this. I don't know where it's been. You know what he's saying here? Can I just put it on the bottom shelf for you? Don't be a Christian snob. That's what he's saying. Now, that's the Tennessee version of Paul. (laughs) That's what he's saying. He quoted Psalm 24 in verse 26. And he's asserting the fact that everything on the earth belongs to God. 
So practical directions regarding the proper use of our Christian liberty are to seek the good of others, to eat the marketplace food. Notice verse 27 through 30. It also includes eating with unbelievers. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So he says, listen, if you're invited to eat, go eat. Having no question for conscience sake, don't go, I don't know if I can eat with those people. I don't know what they did to this food. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've been a few places where I've been leery of eating. I have. I've seen some food at places. I'm not sure what part of the animal that was. I'm going to mess up the name of it. But do you realize there's a type of taco that's made with pork brains? And they say it's good. That's one of those where you don't ask questions. Here's, here's a practical one. Don't read the potted meat ingredient list. Have you ever had potted meat? It's got stuff in there you wished you just didn't know. Now, I'll, I'll confess something to you. Sometimes with saltines, I like potted meat. I know it sounds crazy because it doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good. But there are times where that's the truth. And he says, listen, if you go to eat, you don't have to ask. Now, what was your process in slaughtering this animal? No, no, eat. But then I want you to notice a caveat. Look at verse number 28. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake. Now, we've already talked about meat offered to idols in chapter 8, but there's a clarification here. If the person has you sit down to eat and says to you, now, this meat was offered to idols, he says, eat not. And I want you to point this out. It's not for your sake, it's for his sake. Because it's already been clarified that you can eat this meat that's been offered to idols, but you probably shouldn't because it would cause someone else to stumble. And here he's saying, if the man comes to you and says, you eat this, but it's been offered to idols. He says, don't for the sake of that man. Because here's the truth. If you eat meat offered to idols, they know it's offered to idols. They know you're a Christian. They will take that as your endorsement of offering meat to idols. Takes me back to a story. My dad was, uh, I think, out visiting or got invited over to somebody's house or something or another. And, and, and the person told him the biscuits was made with beer. I don't know why you would do that. So he asked for three more. No, I'm kidding, he didn't. No, why? Because it caused people to stumble. The point is this. You don't have to dig into asking all the questions. However, if they tell you, you stop. Not for your sake, but for their sake. Why? We're going to get to that. He says, listen, this person is showing you this. Oftentimes, I think they do this as a temptation. I've learned this. I don't, say, I don't do this because I'm ashamed of it, but sometimes I do this on purpose. I don't automatically tell everybody. I'm a, I don't walk into a place and go, hey, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. Hey, I learned they treat you differently. Now, it's on two sides of the fence. Sometimes people are like, oh, he's a preacher. I've got to be careful what I do now. And they won't be honest. But I've learned sometimes it's the other way around. They find out you're a preacher. Now, suddenly, ooh, we're going to test him. Remember one guy we met in California, having a great conversation with him. The guy never cursed once, but he brought up something about angels. And my wife said, now, you know, he's a preacher. And all of a sudden, this guy couldn't quit cussing. Do you know there are people out there that will test your Christianity? They'll test you. And Paul says, listen, when you're in the meat marketplace and you're, you're offered this meat, buy it, eat it. It's fine. But if they tell you this was offered to idols, eat not. Not for your sake. Not for your own conscience but for theirs. Now we're going to find the answer of why in verse 31 and verse 33. Verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do you realize we don't give up Christian liberties or choose not to exercise them for our sake? but for the glory of God. Our Christian liberty is not given to us so that we can appease the flesh. Our Christian liberty is given to us so that we can exercise godliness and glorify our God which is in heaven. 
Paul says it doesn't matter if you're eating, if you're drinking, whatever you're doing, do all for the glory of God. Verse 33, even as I please all men and all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many. Why? That they may be saved. As long as you're validating false idols, and as long as you're confirming to people that, well, yes, it's okay if you don't do it God's way. You know, maybe everything will wash out. He says, listen, that's not what we do. We're doing these things that they may be saved. We're going, whoa, I'm not eating food offered to idols because I don't serve idols. I serve a living God. And therefore, we don't validate wickedness. We don't validate sin. We don't validate error. We don't say, oh, will you do it differently? That's okay. No, because we need them to understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need them to understand that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. I was born a sinner. No one had to teach me how to sin. It was something that came natural. Because I was born a sinner. Because of my sin, I have fallen short of a holy God. A holy God who manifested Himself in flesh and His name was called Jesus He lived a perfect life without sin, yet he died on a cross to pay the penalty for my sin because God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you realize too often we are so soft on sin, people don't don't see a need for a Savior. And Paul says, listen, we do this that they may be saved. They need to recognize the fact they are a sinner and have come short of a holy God's demand for perfection. But that holy, loving God sent His Son to pay the price that we by faith could receive the perfect gift of salvation and be saved. Lastly, I want us to look at verse 1. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, I want to pause here just for a moment. Paul here is saying, be a follower of me even as I also am of Christ. Because in this area of life, Paul knew that he had been an example of giving up his Christian liberties, his cultural liberties, for the sake of the salvation of others. He has exemplified this in the way his ministry model was. He became all things to all men that he might win some. When he was with the Jews, he was as a Jew. When he was with the Gentiles, he was as a Gentile and followed their customs and practices as long as those customs and practices didn't interfere with God's commandments. Not only that, Paul laid out six reasons that he had a right to be supported by the church of Corinth. But then he told them, I'm giving up that right because I don't want it to be a stumbling block to people getting saved. And so he was only supported by other churches during his time at Corinth and not the church of Corinth. He had been an example. This is not a verse that is a caveat of why you should seek to be like men. There are too many people who are trying to train others to be like them. And Paul here is not saying, I'm trying to train you to be like me. He's saying to them, you can follow me in this area because I follow Christ. One of the things that to me is, is, was remarkable about the funeral on Thursday when we went to Brother Jim Tedder's funeral was I looked around that church at, at he probably had, I don't know, 40 Preacher boys maybe at his funeral. I think overall he had about 115 preacher boys. But I'd say there was at least 40 there. And I'll be honest with you. My dad could validate this. It was the most diverse group of preachers you would ever see in your life. I don't think there were two people in that group that were alike. That's just the truth. And I say alike. We agree on doctrine and those sort of things. But I'm talking about a whole wide group of different types of people. Do you know why? Brother Jim never trained his preacher boys to be like him. He pushed them to be like Christ. And Paul here is not saying, I'm trying to create a bunch of little Pauls. He's saying, I'm like Christ in this area, and you need to follow me in this area as I follow Christ. Any person who points you to themselves and themselves alone and not to Christ, they're pointing you in the wrong direction. And so we can follow Paul's example. Of course, Paul was following the example of Christ. In fact, Paul reminded the Philippians in one of my favorite passages in the Bible, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Paul said, I'm like Jesus. And Jesus shows to us that Jesus Christ didn't make his ministry about himself. You realize when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords humbled himself to come to earth, he could have come in any way, shape, form, or fashion. In fact, the Jews expected him to come as a conquering king, but instead he came as a stooping servant. Instead of in his final days looking at the disciples and saying to the disciples, you need to listen up and follow my my way, Jesus Christ knelt down and washed their feet. He literally washed the feet of the disciples because he came to serve, not to be served. I wonder how many times as Christians, if we're not careful, we come to be served and not to serve. You say, yeah. But notice Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. They probably had clean feet. You had not been around a lot of Christians if you think that. But I want to point something out very, very important. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples who would betray him, who would deny him, who would run for their own safety, thinking only of self. He knew what they were going to do. And he washed their feet. Do you know why? He came to serve. Too many times people exercise Christian liberty with this mindset. What's in it for me? What can I get by with? What can I do? Here's another dangerous statement. We've all probably said it at some point. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. And Paul's whole message throughout this section on Christian liberty is, there may not be anything wrong with it, but that doesn't mean it's right for you to do. Just because there's not anything wrong with it, just because you can't point to a verse and say, this is sin or this is not sin, doesn't mean you ought to exercise that right. We need to be careful in this idea of Christian liberty that we realize that we need to seek the good of others, but above all, we need to glorify God. Too often, Christians who exercise Christian liberty in a wrong way do so for their own gain and for their own glory. Let's be careful. We don't fall into that trap. We don't live selfishly, but rather we live righteously for the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to open up your word and to grow through the teaching and the preaching of your word. I pray to the Lord today as, as your word was preached, as, as the Holy Spirit convicted us in areas that if we're not careful, we find ourselves seeking after only our own desires and our own wishes, seeking after the things of the flesh instead of things of the spirit, seeking after self instead of serving. Lord, glorifying ourselves instead of glorifying you. I pray, dear Lord, in our lives, we will be sensitive to hear the Holy Spirit as you convict us. But then, Lord, that we will address the issue. We'll fix the problem, the problem of the heart. That our allegiance is in the wrong place. Our allegiance is to self instead of you, Christ. Our allegiance is to what we want instead of what is your will. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll work in our hearts, work in our lives, that we may glorify you that we may honor you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. The music will continue to play. The altar is open. If you need the altar, I invite you to come. I was thinking just now, 
about a story I heard from Miss Jean Smart. She told this story. My dad and I, we went to go visit Brother Dewey in the hospital. This was years ago. Brother Dewey's been passed on now for almost eight years or around that time. He passed away a little bit before I became pastor. So seven to eight years ago. And uh, we were sitting up there at the hospital with Brother Dewey and we were talking. He was doing okay at the time. We were talking and stuff. And she told a story about one time, I believe it was her mother cooked this meal and half the time they didn't know what they were eating. Mom cooked it. You ate it. And you were happy about it. Well, mom had cooked a meal and they'd all eaten it and everything was all right. But then mom brought up the subject. How'd y'all like the food tonight? It was good. She goes, I wasn't sure. She said, that's the first time cooking. If I remember correctly, it was possum. I believe that's what it was. And uh, she said, all of a sudden, they sprinted from the kitchen to the front porch. And what they had just partook in forsook them as they, <laughs> they lost it all. Sometimes it's best just not to ask the question and just eat. You might like it, as long as you don't know what it is. And uh, let's make sure we exercise our Christian liberty correctly.